I am just delighted to have a chance to welcome you all to this new format that we will be following this year. And, and it's exciting. I see that already we're over 434 participants. So that means we're reaching a, a broad audience and it speaks a lot to how we should conduct um, these kinds of presentations in the future to, to make them available to as broad a, and as wide an audience as we can. So thank you for joining us. Um, I just want to take one minute to tell you that, that we're very fortunate here at the Huntington. Many years ago, three years, three to four years ago, when we, were, when we began looking at the final stage of construction, um, it, was, it was a little daunting because we did not have at that point a curator to the Chinese garden and, and of course the person who's the director of the East Asian Garden Studies Program. And we just, I just felt that I did not want to enter into that final phase of construction without having someone help guide the aesthetics and the program. Because all along the way, there's so many decisions to be made. Um, and also, we did not want the program to languish. We wanted the program to remain vigorous and strong. Uh, we were incredibly fortunate to have um, the opportunity to meet Dr. Philip Bloom at that time, and even more fortunate that Philip agreed to come and um, take over the position of uh, the dual positions of curator of the Chinese Garden and um, director of this fledging, fledgling but but certainly important concept of a center for East Asian Garden Studies. Uh, Philip comes to us for having grown up in the West. He went to Middlebury College. He studied um, art history and. Uh, went on to Harvard for his PhD, where, um, where his interests were broad and started with contemporary Chinese art and moved into um, fascinating aspects of art in Buddhism. Um, Philip has traveled extensively in both Japan and China. Uh, he has worked at various museums, launched expeditions and um, uh, uh, exhibitions and taught um, in college at the uh, University of Indiana. He comes to us with um, incredible enthusiasm and incredible background and a desire to continue learning. And today, um, Philip has moved happily into a realm that takes art into the real experience of the garden. And he's gonna talk about that for you. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Philip Bloom, who is, I hope, gonna be here a long time helping to guide the progress of this garden. Thank you so much, Jim, for your incredibly kind introduction. Um, let me share my screen. So thank you all so much for being here. And Jim, thank you again for your incredibly kind introduction. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be able to work for the Huntington's Chinese Garden. So tomorrow is a very exciting day for our garden, uh, Liu Fang Yuan. The garden's final major phase of construction will open to the public, and that will bring to fruition 16 years of construction, about 33 years of dreaming, planning, building, and planting. The garden is now the largest Suzhou-style garden outside of China, and more importantly, the garden fully embodies the spirit of pre-modern Suzhou scholars' gardens. The sensory appeal of Liu Fang Yuan is immediate. Its flowing waters delight the ears. Its paths and pavilions please the eyes. Its fragrant flore uh, entice the nose. Its textures even tickle the feet. And actually, a few of its plants can even beguile the tongue, like the plantains in our plantain court. So it's easy to delight in the sensory satisfactions of this garden. But thanks to the foresight of Jim Folsom, whom you just saw, and June Lee, the founding curator of the garden, as well as many other staff members and donors, the Ofang Yuan is much more than a physical space whose plants, waters, and rockeries delight our senses. It's also a space where calligraphy and poetry imbues the landscape. It's a space where performances transform historical forms of theater. It's a space where art installations give contemporary meaning to modern or pre-modern idioms 
It's a place where lecturers share their work on everything from herbal medicine to contemporary architecture. In short, it's also a space of intellection. The physical and mental spaces of the garden work hand in hand to inspire public interest in Chinese garden making. The Ofang Yuan's combination of these two modes of engagement, the sensory and the intellectual, thoughtfully parallels the ways that garden, scholars' gardens functioned in the past. So just like us in our own backyards, pre-modern garden owners retreated to their private landscapes to escape the pressures of daily life, to relax amid the sensory delights of plants, like you see in this 16th century painting. However, Garden owners also dedicated pavilions to educating their family's children. They studied plants in order to gain insights into the ways that the universe functioned. They composed poetry and they wrote histories. In short, gardens pleased their owners' senses at the same time as they enabled them to engage in intellectual and social pursuits. The multifunctionality of pre-modern Chinese gardens, I think, poses an interpretive problem. How can we see gardens as spaces whose many functions are not just disparate, but are actually unified? How can we conceptualize gardens in a way that accounts for these many different functions while also clarifying their overarching design program? Or to put the question more concretely, what do the sensory delights of Liu Fangyuan have to do with its calligraphy, its books, and its lectures? So today, I'd like to contend that attending to the pleasures afforded by Chinese gardens actually allows us to reconcile the various functions that these spaces fulfill. Thanks to the comprehensiveness of pre-modern theorizations of pleasure, gardens could be simultaneously aesthetic, productive, restorative, and more. That is, they could produce food for the family, they could serve to educate children, they could also be spaces where you simply relaxed with friends. And all of these ideas come together through the notion of pleasure. So to understand this, we'll need to undo some of what I've just done. Specifically, Rather than separating the sensory, delights, uh, sensory delight and intellectual stimulation, we need to look at these two forms of engagement together. We need to understand pleasure in the holistic sense that pre-modern garden owners did. So my focus today will be the gardens of the Song Dynasty, which ruled China from 960 to 1279. As Yinong Shu has also discussed, extant records of Song Dynasty gardens reveal that pleasure taking was an overriding concern of garden makers ranging from emperors to recluses, from officials building prefectural parks to scholars seeking to house their families. So today I'll first introduce some classical conceptions of pleasure that most garden makers in the Song would have known. I'll then turn to a couple of case studies. Each of these gardens speaks to a slightly different understanding of the pleasures of garden making. Moreover, each of these gardens features actually provided different sensory and intellectual forms of engagements to their owners and visitors. Collectively, these gardens demonstrate the utility of interpreting the varied functions of garden making through the lens of pleasure. And I realize that talking about the pleasures of garden making probably sounds really obvious. Everyone who has a garden probably takes pleasure in gardening. But what I'm hoping that you'll see through these case studies is that actually pleasure was a much broader concept in pre-modern China than we typically think of it today. There were ethical pleasures of gardening, there were political pleasures of gardening, there were moral pleasures, along with the sensory and intellectual delights that we might typically think of. And so to conclude my talk, I'll discuss why all of this matters. Um, specifically, I'll suggest that understanding the pleasures of Song Gardens might actually provide all of us with inspiration to engage more ethically with our world. So what exactly was pleasure in pre-modern China? The word I'm translating as pleasure is le in Mandarin. Le can be used as a noun, a pleasure, or as a verb to take pleasure in something. Just as in English, which uses the terms pleasure, joy, delight, happiness, etc., almost interchangeably, 
Literary Chinese contains a number of terms that express similar forms of enjoyment. However, Le holds pride of place. As Michael Nyland has noted, um, Le concerns things or activities that bring deep, rich, enduring satisfaction. They actually imply a kind of ongoing tie between the person who seeks pleasure and the thing or activity in which they take pleasure. Consequently, pleasures typically possess both sensory and intellectual dimensions. So the senses might lead one to a pleasure, but it's usually the combination of both sensation and intellection that sustains one in that pleasure. Moreover, Nylon has shown that the highest forms of Le were relational pleasures. For example, taking pleasure in friendship, in family, even in things like good governance or virtue. Such pleasures could only be cultivated over time and they required delaying immediate gratification in order to pursue lasting benefit. Perhaps most importantly, pleasure was always conceived in relation to stability. Essentially, you couldn't experience pleasure unless your life was stable and your society was stable. Indeed, in pre-modern China, the opposite of pleasure wasn't pain as it typically is in the West. Instead, the opposite of pleasure was instability and its emotional, co and its emotional cognate, worry or anxiety. The complexity of this theory of pleasure is probably best exemplified by music. And as many of you might know, the character for music, which is pronounced yue in Mandarin, is actually the same as the character for pleasure, le. Music possesses the qualities I've just described. It unites the senses and the intellect. Mastery of it must be cultivated over time in order for its delights to become enduring. And in pre-modern contexts, music was almost always experienced socially. Pleasure is discussed in many works of Chinese philosophy, um, but three clusters of classical references proved especially important to garden makers. Before we look at the gardens that will be the focus of my talk, I'd like to review some of these references to give, give a sense of what Song Dynasty garden makers had in mind when they were thinking about their landscapes. So first, many of you might remember that the opening lines of Confucius's Analects actually concern pleasure. To learn and to put into practice at the appropriate time, is this not a joy? To have friends come from afar, is this not a pleasure? In essence, the entirety of the Chinese philosophical tradition begins with a statement that equates learning, sociability, and pleasure. In fact, many later commentators suggested that learning without friendship or without sociability could never be pleasurable. Not surprisingly, at least one high-minded Song Dynasty scholar named the central hall in his garden the Hall of the Pleasures of Friends. Actually, Confucius comments many times on pleasure in the course of his Analects. He famously pronounces that the wise take pleasure in mountains, while the good take, excuse me, the wise take pleasure in waters, while the good take pleasure in mountains. He argues that to know something is not as good as to love it. To love something is not as good as to take pleasure in it. He praises his beloved disciple, uh, Yan Hui, for never having ceased to take pleasure in learning despite having had but a handful of rice to eat, a gourd full of water to drink, and narrow alleys to reside in. And he contends that pleasure is also to be found in eating coarse grains, in drinking cold water, in bending the elbow to pillow the head. These notions all became touch points for later garden makers, particularly those who prided themselves on the frugality of their lifestyle and the asceticism of their taste. So drawing on these notions, Song Dynasty garden owners named pavilions things like the pleasures of Yen Hui, or the pavilion of knowing and taking pleasure. Muncius, uh, who developed Confucius's intellectual tradition about a century after his death, treated the political dimensions of pleasure. He recognized that humans innately seek sensory delight. And so consequently, 
he sought not to dissuade the rulers whom he served from pursuing pleasure. Instead, he endeavored to make sure that commoners would be able to share in the same pleasures as their rulers. So in a discussion with King Shren of the state of Qi, he asks, is it more pleasurable to take pleasure in music alone or with others? Is it more pleasurable to take pleasure in music with a few people or with a multitude? And of course, the answer is that it's more pleasurable to share music with the multitudes. Further, Munch has argued that rulers should seek pleasure only after ensuring their subjects' well-being. He even argued that they could build grand parks or gardens as long as commoners could have access to them. And so the image that you see on this screen is an 11th century painting in the collection, or a detail of an 11th century painting uh, in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And if you look very closely in the upper right hand corner of the image, you'll see a group of scholars having a banquet. They're being entertained by musicians and dancers, they're feasting. Meanwhile, across the river to the left, there is a group of beggars who are almost invisible. Um, in the upper left hand corner of the image. And in the foreground of the image, again across the river, there are a group of people who are engaging in different forms of social relations, but who all seem to be undergoing some kind of hardship. And so this painting um, kind of functioned as a critique of the corrupt scholar officials of this particular moment. It's almost a Munchian critique of how scholar officials really should be thinking about the beggars um, among them rather than focusing on banqueting. Munchus's imperative that rulers share their pleasures with their subjects actually did inspire dozens of garden owners in the Song and after. The Song central government, for example, established a number of metropolitan parks in the capital that were open to everyone on holidays and on cer at certain times of year. They were actually open to scholar officials essentially all the time, but they were only open to commoners at certain times of year. And you're seeing an illustration of one of these parks called the Jinming Pond, um, which was a site of kind of um, waterborne festivities every spring. Um, the Song central government also built a park called the Garden of Mutual Pleasure that truly was named after the Munchian idea that pleasure should be shared with everyone. Further, in Edo period Japan, a number of domainal lords found inspiration in Munches as well. And in fact, three of the most ex important extant gardens from the 18th and 19th centuries take their names directly from Munches. Two of these gardens are called the um, gardens of later taking pleasure, the idea being that a ruler should take pleasure after um, their people have taken pleasure. And another is called the gar garden of shared pleasure, the kairakuen. And I'm showing you just one photograph of a garden of later taking pleasure in Okayama um, in Western Japan. And finally, um, we at the Huntington took the name of our celebration court in the expanded garden. Um, it's called the Terrace of Shared Delights. And it's a site that will eventually serve as the place where we hold annual Chinese New Year celebrations as well as the Mid-Autumn um, Festival. And the, the name uh, Terrace of Shared Delights comes directly from Munches. So a final major cluster of early conceptions of pleasure appears in the philosophical Taoist text called the Zhuangzi. One full chapter of this book is devoted to the question of supreme pleasure. It's a phrase that actually appears frequently in the names of pavilions in the Song. The eponymous narrator of the text argues, albeit circuitously, that supreme pleasure is to be found in according with the natural way or Tao of things. He says essentially that nothing should be done in a concerted or artificial manner, and instead one should simply live according to one's proclivities in order to find true pleasure. In short, supreme pleasure implies a kind of perfect unity among sensation, intellection, action, and being. To a certain degree, these notions are registered in the name of our Bridge of the Joy of Fish, um, which draws its name from the Zhuangzi as well. And I'd be happy to explain how this bridge relates to pleasure in the Q&A. It doesn't really relate to the rest of my talk very directly. 
So thanks to the civil service examination, which mandated that all officials memorize the same canon of texts in order to become government officials, most literate people in pre-modern China were familiar with the conceptions of pleasure that I've just outlined. And the illustration that you're seeing is simply an illustration showing uh, two, one, uh, two budding scholars taking the exams to become an official. These scholar, scholar officials shared an understanding that pleasures are both sensory and intellectual, that they're, re, they're the result of long-term commitment, that they're meant to be enduring and sustaining, and most importantly, they understood typically that pleasures should be shared. Consequently, when they were conceiving of their gardens, they drew frequently on these references, and in doing so, they integrated their gardens into a textual tapestry of pleasure. Nevertheless, they didn't necessarily use these conceptions in the same way. Instead, garden owners would select or transform these references in order to signal the values that they held dearest. So for example, almost every literate person would have known the texts of Confucius and Muntius, but they might have situated themselves differently in relation to those texts. So with all of this in mind, let's turn to two case studies. The gardens I'll discuss draw on these classical conceptions of pleasure, but each uses these ideas slightly differently to account for the different functions that the garden fulfilled. Inspired by Munches, the first garden I'll discuss, which is known as the suburb of pleasure, uh, functioned as an idealized park of collective pleasure taking. The second, a private garden, um, afforded certain solitary pleasures that were rhetorically palatable only to certain scholars. But in actuality, the garden adapted the ideas of both Muntius and Confucius to become a space of sagely pleasure that functioned ultimately as a kind of rebuke of contemporary politicians. So rather paradoxically, at least to a modern Westerner, the discourse of pleasure became used in a kind of ethical way to say that what politicians at the time were doing was wrong. So let's start with the Northern Song Park that was known as the suburb of pleasure. Um, it was developed by an official named Liu Chang uh, in, around 1057 or 1058. And it was located outside of the city walls of Dongping in modern Shanxi, uh, excuse me, Shandong province in northern China. Um, so you can see toward the top of the map is Beijing, um, toward the lower right hand corner of the map is Shanghai, and Dongping is in the center with the red marker. Liu was actually a close friend of Mei Yao Chen, whose poems appear in several spots in the Huntington's Chinese Garden. And actually, Mei Yao Chen also wrote poems specifically on the suburb of pleasure. So Liu's suburb of pleasure exemplifies a Munchian approach to public or semi-public garden building. Moreover, um, his garden suggests how Munchius is imperative to please the people might intersect with the sensory and or social pleasures pursued by scholar officials themselves. So Liu begins his account of the suburb of pleasure with an appeal to the past. He eulogizes, in antiquity, even if the various officials were poor, they still were sure to have the delights of parks, gardens, chariots, horses, bells, and drums, along with the pleasures of ponds, terraces, birds, beasts, fish, and turtles. For only then were they able to serve their state. It's not that in setting their minds on delight, they elevated trivial things. Rather, by bringing together scholars and by associating with visiting worthies, they united officials and commoners. So in essence, a public garden was essential to governance. However, Dongping lacked such a park when Liu arrived in 1057. Consequently, he says, scholars had nowhere to roam, visiting worthies had nothing to contemplate, and officials and commoners alike had nothing or nowhere in which to take pleasure. For Liu, this make, made politics impossible because for him, governing necessitated the provision and regulation of pleasure. <clears throat> 
But actually for Leo, the offense of not having a park was even deeper. He says that lacking a public garden was not to respect the books of odes and documents, not to accord with the intentions of the classics of rites and music. So these four texts were understood to be the foundations of Confucian government, governance. They were texts that every official memorized and really knew innately. Consequently, for to lack a garden really was to violate the very foundations of Confucian society. Consequently, Leo began to build. He constructed a central hall, a terrace, a pond, a gallery, a pavilion, a lodge, and two gates. Unfortunately, he doesn't provide further detail about the layout of the garden, but the features he enumerates were common to Sung gardens of all types. And most frequently, a central hall would have been paired with a square pond. And this actually remained a common practice in Korea well into the 19th century. So I'm showing you a photograph of a royal garden in Seoul um, that was actually just renovated in 2012, but whose features were developed over the course of about the 16th to 19th centuries. Other features of the garden would have been arrayed around the central sites, um, around the square pond and the central hall. So to advance his project of governance, Leo suggest, or selected names um, for each site based in the Book of Rites because of affairs alluding to things and announcing his intentions. In other words, just as we did for Leo Fang Yuan, he chose names for each feature of the garden that referred to classical texts that echoed the characteristics of the site itself and that illuminated his own values. So for example, he called the central hall stability and pleasure, which is a phrase that's taken from the Book of Odes, but it's also a phrase that describes an ideal society. After all, stability was understood to be the prerequisite for pleasure, and an ideal society was one in which was a stable society in which all people could pursue pleasure. He named the pond aquatic grasses, um, which is a phrase that's also drawn from the Book of Odes and that through Confucian interpretations became an allusion to upright officials. The names of other features referred to the garden's idealized delights. So the pavilion was called dallying with fragrances, an allusion to sensory pleasures. The lodge was called pleasure in roaming, again, a kind of sensory pleasure, but also a pleasure that typically was pursued socially. And ultimately, Leo says, because of its location outside of the city walls, I called the garden the suburb of pleasure, for it gives the same pleasures to high and low alike. In short, Leo's suburb of pleasure was intended to afford a comprehensive Munchian experience of pleasure to both officials and their subjects. That experience was registered even in the names of the garden's features which functioned almost propagandistically in proclaiming the virtues of the official Leo who had constructed the park and in asserting the delights that the park offered to its visitors. Somewhat unusually, Leo complements his discussion of the political pleasures of the park with an extensive list of the plants that he cultivated there. The specimens include three major groups. Um, first, woody plants, including expected trees like pines, willows, flowering plums, along with a number of fruiting trees and shrubs, even grapes. Second, plants associated with specific place names, and I'll discuss these more in a moment, but you might note that e these plants even include grasses from the cemetery of Confucius himself. And finally, um, flowering, particularly herbaceous plants, including peonies from Northern and Southern China, as well as a variety of water plants. And notably, Leo insists that all of these plants can be both enjoyed in the sense of smelling and seeing, but also they can be eaten. The, these specimens, I think, are noteworthy in two respects. 
first, they're all both useful and ornamental. None of them lacks an elementary medicinal or material function, but all of them, of course, have beautiful flowers or forms. And secondly, they include both local flora and specimens imported from elsewhere. Most interestingly, the plants associated with specific place names, so for example, bamboo from Mount Tai, dwarf bamboo from the banks of the Wen River, phoenix tree from Eyang, etc., as well as the herbs from the Cemetery of Confucius, all originate in places throughout Shandong province within the immediate vicinity of Dongping. And further, all of these plants are mentioned in classical texts. Consequently, these specifically named plants can be understood to have held both specific local and general cultural value. That is, they were specifically associated with Shandong itself, and yet at the same time, every scholar official throughout China would have known of these plants because of their reading of classical texts. Consequently, the plants of the suburb of pleasure, I think, functioned in at least three different ways. They afforded sanctuary pleasure, they provided elementary sustenance or fulfilled other practical uses, and they constituted a living collection of famous local flora. Strikingly though, it's actually Leo's registry of plants that leads him to talk about Muncius. He draws a direct connection between the plants of this garden and the pleasures that Muncius promoted. Specifically, he quotes Muncius's response to King Huan of Qi, who asked whether worthies take pleasure in things like gardens and animals. And Muncius replied, worthies do indeed take pleasure in them after others. But those who are not worthy do not take pleasure in them, even if they have such things. In other words, taking pleasure in plants and gardens is precisely what an upright official should do so long as he's first ensured that his subjects are secure, so long as he's ensured their well-being, and so long as he ensures that his pleasures are being shared with them. Thus, Leo's discussion of the suburb of pleasure exemplifies a Munchian approach to semi-public garden building. And this kind of approach was actually quite common throughout the Northern Song period. Rhetorically, these parks existed to be shared. They provided officials and their subjects with spaces in which to seek pleasure. In actuality, of course, it was officials who most benefited from such a park. Access, access likely was free throughout the year to officials, but probably was restricted to certain times for commoners, as was true of the imperial parks in the capital that I mentioned earlier in this talk. Further, um, Leo's primary motivation in constructing the garden was to create a space in which to socialize with peers. And of course, he says that socializing with other scholars is a prerequisite to governing well. But at the same time, it's hard not to imagine that he was at least somewhat self-interested. And so I'm showing you an image from the 12th century of an imperial feast for a group of officials. And you can see just how elaborately they did indeed feast. But the brilliance, I think, of Munches' theory of pleasure and actually of his political philosophy more generally lies precisely in its capacity to redirect officials' self-interest to benefit the people. He says, yes, of course, officials will want to socialize with others and have wonderful banquets and build beautiful gardens. And that's fine, as long as they ensure that those delights are also shared with the people that they govern. So in the end, I guess, the suburb of pleasure provided space to roam, pavilions to appreciate, names to savor, and plants to study. And in doing so, it afforded sensory and intellectual enjoyment to both officials and their subjects. So just 15 years after Liu Chang built his suburb of pleasure, the historian Sima Guang established the most famous private garden in Song China. And it's a garden that challenged much of the discourse of pleasure that I've just been discussing. This was the garden of solitary pleasure constructed in 1073. 
In 1070, Sima Guang had withdrawn from his post in the capital city of Kaifeng in protest of new policies that were being promulgated by an official named Wang Anshu. And the following year, he exiled himself 200 kilometers west to the ancient capital city of Luoyang. He so objected to these new policies, which he thought were completely misguided, that he just retired from the government entirely to instead continue writing a grand history of China up to about the year 900 or 951. And so on the map, you can see where Kaifeng and Luoyang are located in central China more or less along the valley of the Yellow River. Living in self-exile, Sima Guang built a garden whose specific sensory and intellectual pleasures were at once unique to him and exemplary of true sagehood. He created a space that fulfilled many practical functions. It provided him space to read, it produced medicines, it provided him flowers to enjoy. But it was also a space that enabled him to mount a political and ethical critique of his opponents. All of these functions ultimately he wove together through deep consideration of pleasure. And throughout this section of my talk, I'll be showing you details of a painting that was created probably in the mid 16th century. So 400, um, almost uh, 400 years after Sima Guang created his garden. And the painting is based directly on the textual record of the garden that Sima Guang wrote. But of course, there's a kind of painter's imagination involved in reconstructing the garden. Nevertheless, it gives you a fairly good sense of the kinds of activities that Sima Guang pursued in the space of this garden of solitary pleasure. Um, as you'll see, if you look in the upper right hand corner of the screen, it's held in the Cleveland Museum of Art and their official title for the work is The Garden for Solitary Enjoyment. Um, I translate it as The Garden for Solitary Pleasure. So Sima Guang's garden centered on his hall for reading books, where he kept a collection of 5,000 volumes. During the decade that he lived in the garden, he spent much of his time in this hall completing his authoritative history of China. To the south, um, he built the Dallying with Water Gallery, which was set amid a small pond and branching streams. To the north of the hall, he excavated a larger pond whose central islet was planted with bamboo. And he tied the stalks of the bamboo together to create a fishing hut. Um, further north, he built a thick-walled structure that was called the Planting Bamboo Studio, and not surprisingly, he planted bamboo around it um, to deflect summer heat. And also, I just would draw your attention, um, as you're looking at these images, just note how many gardeners um, are involved in this scroll. Even though this was called the Garden of Solitary Pleasure, it required an, almost an army of workers who undoubtedly were underpaid to um, create this kind of ideal, idyllic space for the scholar official. And one of the things I think is so interesting about um, this particular painting of the garden is that it really insists on the contributions of the gardeners um, to create a space that ostensibly was for sol solitary pleasure. To the east of the pond, he cultivated a plot of 120 varieties of medicinal plants. And although Sima Guang claims in his record that he simply wished to learn the names of all of these plants. His poems testify that he had a penchant for using medicinal plants as metaphors for curing the political ails of the state. And actually a surprising number of his poems also detail how he exchanged transplants or cuttings of medicinal plants with close friends. And just as an aside, I'd note that we're taking the name of our medicinal, our Chinese medicinal garden, which will open next year, um, from Sima Guang's as well. And we're very much looking forward to opening this new section of um, the Chinese garden that will be populated with about 220 species of medicinal herbs that are coming from the Chinese medicinal herb farm in Petaluma, California. And it, it, um, we really were inspired actually by Sima Guang's garden in thinking about creating this um, space 
for learning about medicinal herbs and we're delighted to be able to work uh, with Peg Schaefer at the Chinese Medicinal Herb Farm in creating this garden. Finally, um, south of the medicinal plot, he also planted six beds of peonies and other flowers. And he complemented these beds with a pavilion for watering flowers. Um, he specifically limited the number of specimens in each bed, again, because he primarily wished to learn their names. In other words, he always was seeking to intellectualize plants. He wasn't seeking to uh, aestheticize them or to simply appreciate them for their fine fragrance or beautiful form. And ultimately, he constructed a viewing mountains terrace from which he could gaze out of the garden. So just to give you a sense of how all of this fit together, um, this is a Chinese scholar's reconstruction of what the, how the garden might have been laid out um, based on the textual record that Sima Guang uh, wrote. So each feature of the garden was actually named in homage to a specific historical figure, as Robert Harris of Columbia University has also discussed. These include um, figures like uh, of scholars, poets, and recluses, and all of them were people who had ignored the temptations of position and profit. Instead, they all remained steadfast in their pursuit of learning and morality, even though that often meant that they had to undergo materially deprived existences. And so consequently, the figures after whom he named each of these pavilions exemplified the kind of ethical and also political stance that Sima Guan was taking in response to the new policies of Wang Anshi. Although Sima Guan seems to have valued scholarship above all else, he designed each feature of his garden to afford a specific form of bodily pleasure that he could enjoy alone, or that he alone could enjoy. He writes that he spends most of his time reading, but when he tires, he would go outside to catch fish, to gather herbs, or to water flowers. Strikingly, Sima Guan contends that his pleasures are so modest that they're not worthy of being shared with other people. In fact, he actually begins his account of the garden by self-deprecatingly contradicting both Mencius and Confucius. Mencius's conception of sharing pleasures with the multitudes, he says, is a form of pleasure taking that's unique to kings, nobles, and great people. Confucius's contention that there's pleasure to be found in coarse grains, cold water, and a bent elbow describes pleasures that are known only to sages and worthies. These Sima rites are unattainable by a fool like me. But Sima Guan does not covet his pleasures for himself. At the end of his record, he actually he directly confronts a Muncian critique of his garden. So an imagined interlocutor asks, I've heard that the pleasures of a gentleman should be shared with others. Now you, sir, have gotten enough for yourself, but you do not extend it to others. Is that really acceptable? And so Sima Guang replies, how can I be compared to a gentleman? I fear that my pleasures would be insufficient for myself, so how could I extend them to others? What I take pleasure in is the simple and the rustic, which the world rejects. Certainly, if there were people who were willing to share these pleasures, I'd bow repeatedly and offer them to them. How could I dare monopolize my pleasures? In short, Sima is saying that his garden afforded simple pleasures, books to read, herbs to pick, flowers to water. But these pleasures, like Sima Guang's politics, were of the sort that ostensibly were only enjoyed by misfit intellectuals who were unconcerned with profit and position. Sima Guang says he's very willing to share these pleasures, and just as he might have been willing to share his politics if the times were right, but he feared that they would prove equally unpalatable to his contemporaries. But Sima Guang's rhetoric of humble isolation was at least partially disingenuous. Poetry and prose composed by his friends reveal that his garden was actually a social hotspot. 
He frequently fraternized with his neighbors, the Zhang brothers, who lived in the garden for assembling recluses. His own garden became a key meeting point for fellow conservatives in Luoyang. His younger associate, Su Shi, actually joked, you, sir, lie at home and do not go out, yet you attract everyone from the clubs of Luoyang. Luoyang actually became a kind of center for discontent politicians during um, the period of Wang Anshu's influence. But perhaps most surprisingly, Sima Guang's Garden of Solitary Pleasure was open to the paying public in the spring. His gardener accumulated so much money from tips and ticket sales that he actually paid for a small pavilion to be erected over the garden's well. Thus, despite Sima Guang's rhetoric of solitude, he actually shared his garden's pleasures quite widely with others. His posturing, I think, fulfilled two functions. On the one hand, by claiming that his humble uh, pleasures were of no use to the world, he set himself apart from his political opponents, who were actively claiming that they were bringing benefit to everyone through their new policies. On the other hand, in opening his garden to friends and visitors, Sima Guang himself carried out the sage-like sharing of pleasure that he self-deprecatingly declared was impossible for a mere mortal to achieve. In short, Sima Guang simultaneously denied the classical tradition of pleasure-taking while also enacting it, thereby proving his worthiness over that of others, uh, other, his political opponents. So in the end, the Garden of Solitary Pleasure fulfilled a variety of functions. It was productive, it cr produced medicinal herbs, it provided um, sensory and physical pleasures of fishing, watering flowers, chopping bamboo, it provided mental and intellectual pleasures, books to read, spaces to write, places in which to socialize, it even provided herbs to contemplate in a form of protobotany. But its most important function, arguably, was political or ethical. By theorizing the simple pleasures of this garden and by situating them in relation to the classical notions of pleasure, and further, by sharing those pleasures with other people, Sima Guang could ultimately succeed in mounting a pointed rebuke of his opponents. It's precisely thanks to the capacious conception of pleasure that these functions can be understood as united. So where does all of this leave us? As different as the suburb of pleasure and the garden of solitary pleasure may be, they each were created to afford specific physical or sensory and intellectual or mental pleasures to their owners and visitors. In each case, physical or sensory interactions with plants, with ponds, with fish, with friends, along with intellectual engagements with reading, writing, and contemplating, are united through references to classical conceptions of pleasure. These classical conceptions insist upon the enduring, sustaining nature of such pursuits. In referring to these examples, which were almost universally known to members of the scholar official class, garden owners wove their creations into a comprehensive tapestry of pleasure whose patterning could be altered to fit the particular predilections or politics of the garden owner. Each of these gardens demonstrates that thinking about Chinese garden making through the lens of pleasure provides a compelling means of reconciling the many functions that gardens fulfilled, garden, uh, functions that often seem disparate at best and contradictory at worst. Given the continuum between sensation and intellection that's presupposed in these pre-modern theories, it becomes possible to speak about an overarching program of pleasure underlying the design of an individual garden. So for example, Sima Guang helps us to understand that each feature of his garden afforded specific sensory delights, the pleasures of watering flowers, gathering herbs, etc. His garden was a productive garden, it was also a sensory, or it's, it was also an in intellectual garden. It was a space in which he could read and write and pursue botany. But ultimately, the sensory and intellectual pleasures of his garden could combine for him to mount an ethical argument against the ruling politicians of his time. But so what 
Why do pre-modern conceptions of pleasure and gardening matter in a 21st century pandemic-ridden world? I think they matter for a very simple reason. The pleasures of Chinese gardens are fundamentally ethical. According to these garden makers, gardens are only pleasurable if they're built in accordance with the inherent way of the cosmos, that is, if they do not interfere with how other people, living beings, or phenomena function, and more important, and further, they're only pleasurable if they're constructed such that they benefit not only their owner, but also others. Certainly, gardens always please their owners first and foremost. But to be truly pleasurable, that self-benefit must be complemented with profound consideration of others, both human and non-human. For me, one of the enduring appeals of Chinese philosophy lies precisely in this imperative to understand self and other as inextricably bound, and further, in following Munches, to consider others' pleasures before one's own. Certainly, I don't wish to suggest that all pre-modern Chinese scholar officials had some sort of enlightened view of social relations. They lived in a profoundly stratified society. They actively benefited from and endeavored to preserve that stratification. Nevertheless, and I think it's particularly true in the Northern Song, officials like Liu Chang and Sima Guang seem to have been motivated by a deep sense of duty to their constituents, which in turn seems to have been rooted in an understanding that all people, and possibly even all living beings, have specific responsibilities to each other. In building Liu Feng Yuan, the Huntington has, I think, created precisely such a garden of pleasure. It's a space that affords sensory entry into the intellectual delights of gardening. It's a space that provides visitors and staff alike with deep, enduring pleasure. By leading tours, by working with docents, by creating interpretive materials, by developing exhibitions and sponsoring public programs, we seek to ensure that the sensory and intellectual pleasures of the Ofang Yuan will prove personally sustaining to our members and visitors. And we hope to share these delights ever more equitably in the years to come. Thank you all for taking pleasure in Chinese gardens with us. So um, I'm, we're very happy to take questions. Um, my colleague, Michelle Bailey, will help with um, posing them. So at any time, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box at the top, bottom of, or top of your screen, depending on your device. So we already have quite a few questions. I'm going to try to group them um, in, in areas. So I'm going to start with questions that really relate very specifically to the uh, lecture. Um, the first question, uh, were public gardens open to all? Were they really truly public? And that is, could a peasant or a low caste person really enter? Or by public, do you mean the literate and upper classes? So clarification on what that means. Great, thank you very much for your question. The term, pub I shouldn't have used the term public. I tried to correct myself and say semi-public, um, but, it is true, we do have historical records from the Song that say, truly, at some point during the year, everyone, including uh, both officials and commoners, could enter um, the parks in the capital city. And as um, these records also seem to suggest that officials could enter, you know, public, uh, so-called public parks any time during the year but that access truly was restricted only to certain holidays and to certain weeks in the spring for people outside of the scholar official class. So it's not, they, they were not public parks in the sense that we think of today where you can essentially enter any time of day, regardless of who you are or where you live or what your social class is. Um, they were spaces that did have uh, definite restrictions on them. Although it, they do seem to have been open in a way um, that at least is um, kind of more open than I had realized before beginning to do this research. Okay, the next question, um, again, relating very specifically is, when you talk about production, were the fish in the ponds for consumption? 
Oh, that's a great question. Um, with the gardens I was talking about, I'm not sure. I guess um, Sima Guang says that he liked to go out and catch fish. So it was his private garden. Presumably he ate the fish. Um, in some places uh, in China, there were uh, lakes that were specifically stocked with fish that were meant um, for consumption. But I'm not sure about these um, particular the, the gardens I discussed today, the, the records just don't um, survive, unfortunately. But the plants, the plants do seem to have been used um, in elementary or medicinal ways. And like Liu Chang said in his record of the suburb of pleasure, he, he seems to be quite proud that he's chosen all of these plants that can be both enjoyed for their beauty, but that can also be eaten. And I think one of the really interesting things about um, the plants that end up being used in Chinese gardens, there actually aren't that many that typically are used, particularly in Suzhou style gardens. There are probably around 50 or 60 different species that recur um, over and over again. Um, they tend to be plants that all do have multiple functions. Most of them, um, most of them have a medicinal function. Many of them can be eaten. Of course, things like um, pine and other trees can be used uh, for material, for timber. Um, so pre-modern Chinese, the plants that were planted in pre-modern gardens really do often seem to have been selected both for their kind of cultural resonance. All of the plants that were used in gardens tend to have appeared in some classical text, but they also um, seem to have been chosen for their practical uses as well. I just want to say we have a wonderful audience. We have so many questions. I, there's probably not going to be a way we can get to all of you, but I'm going to try to, to focus more on the questions um, that relate to his presentation. But hopefully we can um, also get to the ones about our garden. Um, next question. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my spot there. Um, if, uh, you haven't, um, let's see, I lost my, oh, here's what I wanted. How were all of these gardens financed? If you can give us some insights there. Oh, great question. Um, <clears throat> the short answer is I don't know entirely. Um, my speculation is that with things like the, the suburb of pleasure, which was sponsored by the magistrate of that particular county. He simply used uh, official funds for it. Um, with the imperial parks, uh, there was a very large, very well-funded um, kind of, I, I can't think of the precise term, but almost like a, a, a garden bureau that was part of the imperial court. And they were responsible for building and maintaining the various imperial gardens around the capital. Um, with private gardens, of course, they were funded typically by the private individual. Um, in the Northern Song, there were a couple, I think, um, I hope I'm not going to embarrass myself, but I think um, Xiao Yong, who was another famous philosopher in the Northern Song, and who had a residence in Luoyang, um, he, the place where he lived was actually purchased on his behalf by a coalition of his friends who got, who got together and um, collected funds in order to kind of bring him to their city. And a number of people actually contributed to purchasing a spot on which he lived. And his garden or his residence ended up being called the Pleasure Nest, the Luo Wu. Um, Sima Guang, I think, uh, because of his high position in the government was, and also because of his family, was, um, had funds to purchase his own garden and to, to fund the, the entire thing. Um, you mentioned planting the, the Chinese herb uh, medicinal garden at the Huntington. Mm -hmm. What other features of a Song Dynasty garden are found at the Huntington? Or were most of these features in Song gardens common if, uh, to most, if not all, classical Chinese gardens? That's, a, that's an interesting question. So, with our garden, we collaborated with a design and construction firm that's based in Suzhou in southeastern China. 
and their specialty um, more or less is Ming and Qing dynasty style gardens, so gardens from somewhat later than the Song dynasty. And we at the Huntington consciously chose to focus on uh, Suzhou style gardens because of their association with scholar official culture, um, because of the kinds of roles that they played in scholar official life. Um, really Suzhou style scholars gardens very closely paralleled how Henry Huntington conceived of his, of his own estate. Um, so I don't think the song was that much of a consideration when we were building our garden. That said, um, I showed a photograph of the pavilion for washing away thoughts, which is a thatched pavilion in the little canyon that runs between the Chinese and Japanese gardens. And that kind of a thatched hut, um, I'm cer certain would have appeared in some Song gardens. It also appeared in Ming and Qing dynasty gardens as well. And also um, a number of the names and poetic couplets that appear in Liu Fangyuan are from uh, Song sources. So for example, the, the name of the freshwater pavilion, which was the cafe um, in our garden, comes from Su Shi, who a poem by Su Shi, who was an 11th century writer. The couplet on that building comes from Mei Alchun, who was a friend of the Alchun. Um, there are references to Su Shi, Huang Tingjian, um, Li Gunglin, and others throughout um, Liu Fangyuan. I'm going to begin. Um, Michelle, Philip, we've got over 35 questions. Um, we've had over 500 participants during most of the um, period, which has been just wonderful to reach this many people. Um, and we have the ability to answer all these questions and send them out to at least the, um, the people who ask them. We may have the ability to make them available to all of you. I do not know what capacity we have. I would just say that the questions we have make a wonderful set of FAQs that we ought to have on the website um, just to, to fill in a lot of questions. People are asking about um, the Chinese medicinal garden, the farm up north in Petaluma. I think that um, if you write them, write Peg in advance, you can arrange a visit. They're asking about other gardens like Quarry Hill. Um, they're asking Philip about the size of gardens in China is always an unusual size. Um, and they're asking questions about the history of this garden and the reasons for developing it. And all of those are wonderful questions, but um, Philip, you might just make a few summary comments that address some of those issues. Uh, let me, so the medicinal garden is an easy question. The, uh, Chinese Medicinal Herb Farm in Petaluma isn't just open to the public, but they have a website and you can make an appointment to vi visit. Um, and I think the owner of the farm, Peg Schaefer, would be very happy um, to share her plants and knowledge with you. She's a really amazing person and amazingly knowledgeable about um, medicinal herbs. Um, there are some questions about, uh, let's see, Oh, the size of gardens. So our garden is now 15 acres, or it will be as of tomorrow. Um, the largest garden in Suzhou is the Garden of the Humble Administrator. And depending on what parts of that whole complex you include, it's, it's around 15 acres too. Um, but that's because it includes three separate, three gardens that previously were separate. Um, so ours is a little bit big in that sense. And in that respect, it, it's probably a little bit closer to some of the like, prefectural parks um, that I discussed a little bit today. Uh, there seem to have been some quite large parks uh, in the Song and in the Ming and in the Qing. Um, a lot of Chinese, or at least the gardens that we typically think of today as quintessentially Chinese um, are from the Suzhou region. And Suzhou is an urban city and it's an urban place. And so consequently, the gardens there tend to be quite small, just an acre, uh, some, sometimes less than an acre, sometimes up to three or five acres. So ours is a little bit uh, unique in that respect, but um, that largely has to do just simply with 
way it is. Um, but California is a, a bit more of an open place than Sujo. Um, let's see. Michelle, were there other questions that you had lined up specifically? There was one actually that I, I thought I wanted to include. They asked very early and it's a little different, but it's a very interesting question. Sure. Chinese garden design has sort of hit a wall with traditional Suzhou style. Where do you see Chinese garden design evolve into? Or are we condemned to a frozen Ming style? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, so it's, it's True, particularly if you look at the kinds of Chinese style gardens that have been built in the West over the past 20 years, that almost invariably they're Sujo style gardens. And actually, if, if you look at a lot of public gardens that are being built in China today, um, they often are Sujo style too. And that primarily seems to be because um, the Sujo style of garden making since uh, probably the early 20th century has really been re regarded as the highest style of garden. Um, and as, as a consequence of that, and also as a consequence of the way um, historical sites are preserved in China and um, yeah, historical sites are preserved in China, um, the company that's in, that originally was created, or the organization that was originally created to maintain historical gardens in Suzhou is now a semi-private, semi-public corporation that is being enlisted to build gardens, both public and private, all over China. So that style really has been disseminated all over the world, as well as throughout many regions of China. Um, but I don't actually think that Chinese garden design has hit a wall at, at all. Um, <clears throat> Chinese garden history tends to be researched in, in China by people who come uh, from architecture and design programs. And there are a lot of uh, scholars of historical Chinese garden making who are also practicing architects. And there's now really a booming interest in architecture and landscape des uh, design in China. And so there are a number of architects uh, working, for example, for Tsinghua University um, who, and several other universities uh, who are really trying to think about like, how do you abstract certain principles from pre-modern Chinese gardens and do something entirely new with them. So there actually was an, archi an architect whose name I'm currently forgetting uh, who participated in a garden, international garden exposition in Berlin a couple of years ago. And he decided he would create his take on Sima Guang's Garden of Solitary Pleasure. And he completely transformed, you know, the, the, bam, the bamboo fishing hut into this kind of glass structure. And he, plant, he chose a very interesting selection of plants um, that somehow to him at least evoked Sima Guang's garden, but that formally, uh, formally looked and felt very, very different. So I think there actually will be quite a lot of innovation in um, contemporary Chinese garden design in, in the years ahead. And actually that's something I'd very much like for us to explore in, in this lecture series um, in the future. Thank you. I, um... Philip, thank you very much for a remarkable lecture and a challenge because you've got me scheduled to give a lecture at the end of the month and I, I don't think I can reach this real level of exploration and depth. So I'm, um, I'm both awed and pleased and a bit challenged, but um, we look forward to seeing you again. We've got two more events this month, right? So you might remind people. Yes, so this Sunday, um, October 11th at 4 p.m., we're showing a video artwork created by our most recent artist and resident in the Chinese garden, Tang Qingyan, um, with a soundtrack created by Wu Man, the internationally renowned pipa lute um, performer, and Kojiro Umezaki, um, a shakuhachi player who has collaborated extensively with the Silk Road project and also teaches at UC Irvine. And um, 
we'll be screening this video and having a live discussion with the artists. So you'll be able to watch the video first and then pose questions afterwards. And then on October 29th, which is also a Thursday at 4 p.m., our very own Dr. James Folsom will be discussing his reflections on the past and future of the Huntington's Asian Gardens. And as probably many of you know, Dr. Folsom was absolutely instrumental in ensuring that we have a Chinese garden. There would not be a Chinese garden at the Huntington without him. And he's also dramatically reshaped um, the Japanese garden. So we're very much looking forward to hearing his reflections and speculations or predictions for the future. <laughs> So thank you all very much for being here. And as Jim said, um, we'll try to respond to as many questions as we can by email. If you submitted your question with your name, um, we'll be able to send you an email response. So thank you again for being here.